Mai vreau să fac mic. Ah, și eu să ce să ce să mă mai știu. Ia, da, pani. Am picat de tot. Briefly uh, about the speaker and uh, about also about this is our first uh, real attempt at a truly interdisciplinary talk because the today's speaker Olaf Mukherjee he is basically an earth scientist and who started his career in uh, he has an MTech in applied earth sciences from Vikram University in Ujjain with uh, postgraduate diploma in remote sensing and GIS. He started his career in the National Institute of Hydrology in Roorkee. And then he had a good opportunity and good luck of working with the most eminent atmospheric scientists in the country, late Professor A.P. Mitra, FRS, in National Physical Laboratory. And since then, over these 20 years or 20 years, he has worked on truly multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary subjects. Particularly, uh, he had followed a multidisciplinary approach of sustainable development of ecosystems using integrating earth and atmospheric sciences parameters with socio-economic considerations in a holistic way. He has been, uh, he is presently a senior technical officer in the National Physical Laboratory in the Radio and Phosphoric Science Department. And uh, he is also the Scientific Secretary of South Asian START Committee. START stands for Systems Training Analysis and Research. And uh, this, there is a Center for Global Change in National Physical Laboratory. He is the Scientific Secretary of that. But he, his interests are very wide ranging. And therefore today he will be speaking to you uh, though he is not a historian, neither he is an environmental scientist, he is more of an atmospheric scientist these days. So we'll be talking on historical perspectives of land use and climate change in big atmospheric plains. I hope you'll enjoy his talk and we'll obviously have a lot of questions because we have a lot of historians. Thank you for Respected uh, Vice Chancellor Madam, respected uh, Professor Dev, uh, respected uh, Professor Malik, uh, honorable faculty members, and uh, dear young friends. A lot of things has been talked about me, but what I feel personally is that I was imposed into a sort of philosophical ideas on earth science for a part of my life. I was at Joshi Mutt working with border roads on landslides and to save villages from destruction. And it was a very challenging job. And about three years of my life, I have been working with border roads at Joshi Mutt. But after that, I, it appeared to me that I was half done. When I entered into uh, atmospheric science field, I was subjected to basically I felt that it was things that was I, I was knowing things underneath. But later on, I came to learn things which are above. And till you know the whole of the thing up and down, you are, cannot give a holistic approach to any model. So we have a very small lifespan. And whatever we f fits into our gray matter, we go on with its advocacy throughout. The world is going to end. Things are going on for a bad times. All negative things which has come up with proper advocacy of atmosphere, atmospheric scientists, basically. USGS has different opinion on this. So before I start, I am at present doing scientific liaisoning with South Asian countries, Maldives, Mauritius, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal. And for every country, we have a focus. For example, for Nepal, we are working on mountain ecosystem. Right from Pamir North, we have different biodiversity arrangement as we go on. One part goes towards Godwin Austin in Karakoram. The other part we start with Peer Panjal at Kashmir. Then we come with Dhaladhar in Himachal. Then we just come with Nanda Devi in the Uttarakhand part, Garhwal part of Uttarakhand. Then we have Panchachuli at Kumau region. That's not that. We come for Hindu Kush region in Himalayas. Then we go towards Annapurna, that is basically with Kanchanjanga. And after all, it goes to uh, Rakan Yoma. Even certain outcrops we can see in Meghalaya and adjoining areas. So the big shield, the big crown we have over us, and the great plains, the Gangetic plains, 
with Brahmaputra and uh, Indus has one third of its sediment flow into the oceans. So this part is quite important and the region between, specifically the region between Ganga and Yamuna, Doha, has been extremely fertile. Land use land cover change has been a phenomena since ever long. But here there are certain points that are quite important to notify at this present. See, nothing is good or bad in the world. Only our thinking makes it so. It's basically the way we think into. We are, the, the world is a host and is very silent. We are basically very bad guests into this and we are every time very loudy about that. But things will go on and on. The world goes on and on and uh, men will come and men may go but the world goes on forever. When we think on these lines, of course, Gandhiji's, those blind people trying to see an elephant, how the biome looks like. Whosoever touched any part, the world looked like that. So basically the biome looks like if a sort of wall or a sharp or a sort of thread alike. But if we need to open all our eyes. Here I think this inter interdisciplinary part is very important. Now we have started talking on socializing of the pixels. We take stakeholders into account, we take uh, academicians, we take policy makers, but the biggest thing today to go on for any program in our country is basically sensitizing our politicians. They should also have certain seats anywhere. Land use land cover change on Indo-Gangetic plain. Indo-Gangetic plain, the word is basically a very wide term which has Indus, Ganges and it goes towards Brahmaputra also till it drains into the Bay of Bengal. But here, instead of the whole thing, I am just trying to concise it for, in, for only Indo-Gangetic plane, the basic Gangetic plane I need to talk about. Now there are four sort of, before we go on with this whole sort of thing, one thing, every year some sort of thing is going on and on. Probably a new sphere has emerged, which we are talking as cryosphere. Cryosphere basically, this is the region basically, Cryosphere basically is a part of Central Asia where of ice laden parts at Mongolia and Adjari from where Sangpo and the basic rivers all originate and they are coming into being. If we have a better study of this cryosphere, we would be in a better position to talk about the climate. Climate had been ever changing. Change is a law of nature. How do we adjust with that? That is the biggest thing. Catastrophe come and go, but our mock and drill is nowhere there. If tomorrow it has to be an earthquake here, we are not prepared. So a lot of things are there, we should talk about preparedness, adaptation, instead of waiting for the extreme events to come. Yes, of course, in our coming present time, uh, geologic hazards have lessened and they have a periodicity, basically. But again, atmospheric hazards have increased to a wide level. We have floods and droughts and a lot of things. But here we are sensitized with a lot of things. Four type of movements I would like to talk about from at the very starting. The first movement is basically air-sea interaction. If we go according to Gaia, he says that the earth is just like an organism and it, there is a thermostat in everything. If it was not that, 21% oxygen in the atmosphere never changed. Where is climate change then? It never changed. Just add few more deci decimals to that and see the, uh, the whole world would be under fire. Even 98 degree Fahrenheit and if it exceeds a little bit of the, and this 98 has been since Jangi's time. So if the body maintains a particular temperature, if the oxygen content in the atmosphere is there, Gaia is perfectly right. But here another thing that I just wanted to emphasize is about Earth's interaction. We call it thermohaline circulation. To see into the energetic plane, we have to see things which are the driving forces all around. This thermohaline circulation is a ribbon sort of structure. It shows where should cold water come through and where should hot water come through. With this concept, this concept has been since time immemorial, since millions of years, it has not changed. If it has not changed, where is the change occurring? Here we need to know about certain effect which we call ENSO. ENSO is, is Southern Oscillation. Pacific Ocean from Central Pacific warm air rising up, taking moisture, coming towards Indian Ocean. If it fails sometimes and goes towards the Caribbean, it's also excellent. It takes away a huge soul of fishes with them and a big angling industry rather, a sort of aquaculture develops in that region. And here we have El Nino. El Nino brings drought and La Nina is marked with cooler parts. And this has an oscillation, two to three years, two to three years. But this had never been before. 
there had been times like I will just quote certain things that I just wrote down and there had been times since four years there was no rains in India and it was all dry area. In Huan Sam's report that we have over uh, uh, certain patches of northern India, he says it was all dry and arid. Only part that where Alexander was unable to move was near the Sindh and Balochistan area. It was not a desert and it was highly dense, dense forest all over. And his movement was difficult into India through those dense forests. We had forests. It's very easy to say it was deforestation and all. We should not practice that and all. But if we don't go for deforestation, where will the timber come from? We need rail sleepers. We need fuel for the rails. We need for wagons and carriages. We need wood. So this deforestation has to take place. So we cannot deny that. Moreover, the biggest country today is biomass burning. Biomass burning has taken up a very big thing, either it is rice straw or it is wheat straw or any sort of wood or cow dung that is creating a havoc. How is it creating a havoc? The second thing that I am going to mention here is the second type of movement that is basically trajectory flow of pollutants. The most human dry topic of today, we have already established four centers at Hanley, Ladakh. The other one is at Darjeeling at Dhanadish Chandra Bose's house which has been transformed into an astroparticle center in Darjeeling. The other is at Sundarban Koikhali Island. The fourth one we tried with Port Blair to see that we put certain telecommuters in air and we got them in Port Blair. How did the reach over there? The biggest thing that we found over it was in Bay of Bengal and adjoining areas things were little uh, uh, bioparticles concentration was more over but in the Arabian sea side it was more of mineralized particles how did it how did these two things came over this was the second part so it means that there is this trajectory flow of pollutants dust stops for example if a volcano occurs see hazard is important disaster is bad disaster is bad because it affects us but hazard is a necessary evil if there were no mass wasting and debris flow, there wouldn't have been any agriculture in the mountains. And again, if there wouldn't have been any type of uh, mass wave volcano, then this big chunk of dust, dust particles as Atkins and particles suspended in the air and cooling the earth, basically what happens, insulation is basically scattered by those dust particles in the higher tropospheric level. And here we have entered into a study which we call as tropospheric stratospheric exchange of gases. As I told you, nothing is good or bad in the world. I will just give you one example. Suppose all glaciers meant what will happen. We will have snow deserts like Sikkim. We will have snow deserts. What will happen then? Ferric and ferrous rich salts will start as dust. It will fall over the sea. The first part, the first member of our food chain, phytoplankton, will emerge. They produce sodium disulfide, we will get sulfate aerosols, cloud formation will start, again raining, again ice packs. So this is basically a cycle. So this was the second thing that I was mentioning, which goes on and on. The third one, which I want to emphasize here is, Wagner's hypothesis probably is still on. We are moving northwards, we are blaming global warming and all those parts. If we have already changed our place, so the monsoonal pattern will change, other things will change. I shall be using a lot of abbreviations. I request the students to please write it down. There is one study which we call MAIRS, M-A-I-R-S, Monsoon Asia study with its headquarters at Beijing. This is basically, pardon? You can write in the I can write also, yeah. It is M-A-I-R-S, MAIRS. So this is Monsoon Asia program. And, and this talks about how the monsoonal changes are going to occur. If we have shifted our place, and if we are moving northwards towards Arctic, then obviously we are into a different sort of climate. We are going away from the tropics. So this is another sort of movement we need to be concerned about. But the fourth type of movement, which is the most important one today, is basically COSPER. ISRO has launched a project called COSPER. This is the biggest energy source, sun. Sun, the interaction of sun with earth. Galileo was impeached when we started counting certain uh, He has just started uh, some dark spots which appeared over the sun, which he said sunspots. What are basically sunspots? In a very quick language, I will not go into deep science. All of a sudden, temperature falls to 15th or 5000 degree Kelvin. 
and whenever there is a inversely proportionality between magnetic field and temperature so magnetic field increases storm surges start storm surges start they start affecting our ionospheric level and their fusion occurs what is fusion nitrogen changing into carbon we are changing shapes you are changed transformed into him he is transformed into her, her like her so this sort of transformation starts because the nucleus gets activated so here what happens we see aurora and flash over our arctic and the antarctic region what is this, this is recharging recharging is taking place just like our cell mobile cell basically because when the earth is basically a geomagnet so this is the third type of movement based on sunspots i will show you that how if we go on with sunspots our astrologers know it very well they have 11 year cycle and they have about 22 year cycle 22 is quite difficult but the 11 year cycle applies and nowadays on that we are working on magneto magnetospheric data we are trying to mark out sunspots sunspots but if you count sunspots if he counts sunspots we need to calibrate also the, we are calibrating it with zurich basically that whether we are right or wrong based on those sunspots we are monitoring it since 1740 1740 onwards we are monitoring sunspots and these are basically curves of 11 years we are into the 24th cycle 23rd cycle the starting of that in 2008 had no sunspots this has never happened since 1740 from 1740 we have the records whereas whensoever in this parabola there is a solar maxima and a solar minima. So the solar maxima comes after five and a half years. Something happens in the world. Either it is a drought or there is a forest fire in a, a big, or there is say sort of heat waves which generated and created havoc in 2004 at, at France. So some certain things happen and this helps our film makers to make films like in 2004 there is a big devastation everything is going on. But the question here is that if we see the 20th cycle, 20th 11 year cycle, it, it was 300 sunspots that time. Then after it reduced to 280, then it was 180. The speculation for this 24th is 90 sunspots only. So are they diminishing? If they are diminishing, probably we are moving towards the little ice age again. We are moving towards the little ice age again. Little ice age 1700 years back. Paris festival was celebrated, ice festival was celebrated. Men lived after that. But again, if those sunspots has a relation with the warmth, but the biggest thing here that I just want to tell you, maybe in 500 years we will see little ice age. One thing is very important that these youngsters should know, nobody dies out of warmth. Warmth is comfortable. We share among ourselves. The whole four extinction were due to freezing. The whole four extinction phases were due to freezing. So here how to integrate it into a small part in Indo-Magnetic plane now. Let me come back. Now here we have an upland and lowland sort of interaction. We have a huge debris flow and sediment flow which is quite constant. In this meta sedimentary terrain which are quite young, they are not yet in their shape. We have two big faults, main central thrust and main boundary fault thrust. And then again, the debris flow which is occurring in the, from the suture zones and all around, the sediments are probably are not exactly the same. The braided channels, the fans which are being created within the alluvium, alluvium are also of 17 types. We talk of Holocene, say about 10,000 years back story, we are not going so bad. They are the Pleistocene time things, they are the most recent ones, alluvium fertile zone. But these are discharged. So if we see a zone and talk the pedologist, that's the sedation that has occurred or the debris flow which is coming up is better for Kadamom in a part of Bareilly and Saharanpur and they with a small part of cash crop can earn that much money or instead of getting their wheat till long long and part of ways. Now there is a very important saying of global warming. Global warming is extremely good for us. I give you an example. We did an experiment called phase for the whole Indo-Gagnetic plane area on C3 plants, C3 photosynthetic plants. Say we took paddy. We started with Pusa. We came back to the pool, another Pusa destination at Samastipur and we tried with each and every variety with open top chambers. We provided carbon dioxide through, open, through uh, nozzles and productivity rose to 40%. It's a very costly affair. Arizona did with oranges, Italy did with tomatoes. 
it was 60 and 40 percent rise in production. If it is like that, so it will take care of our food security also. So if we can provide carbon dioxide in certain patch, patches. So it was open top chamber before, now it is mid phase. Mid phase is basically one hectare of area with pipes and nozzles and providing carbon dioxide. But for C3 plants it is a total success. So doing these experiments tell us that probably the way of thinking, but the question here arises of sustainable agriculture in one way. If we ta I take this word sustainable agriculture in between, one side we have economic, economic uh, complications. The other side we talk about environmental things. But the other thing is acceptance by the farmers. Farmers need to grow only wheat. They need to grow only rice. See what situation has arised. We are in an independent country. Farmers are committing suicide. Since 5th of this month, every day 24, 26 farmers, Fezabar, 48 farmers committed suicide in 10th of this year, this one. Here it was hailstorm and something, the rains were there, torrential rains. People say this as western disturbance. But again, there is a uh, off time rice paddy which is grown over Odisha and West Bengal. They also got destroyed by Kal Vaishakhi and hailstorms. So there also farmers are in trouble, here also farmers are in trouble. So at Pusa there was a Pusa Mela very recently. So a new scheme has come up with economists of basically uh, uh, doing certain sort of insurance, whatever. This has already started with coffee in Karnataka, but uh, imitating that for Ravi also, a sort of group insurance policy has already started for certain quarters. Before I go into this part into details and just talk about land use, what had been earlier, we are talking about two things. See, historical data is not a joke. It's extremely difficult to decipher and get. It's really a talks about, but we get data, but we get, don't get, get data in micro level. The other thing that is very important is our proxies. We can work on proxies. For example, paleo flood sediments. If we study them, we can tell that these occurred so such and such time before and it can have a repetitivity again. There are certain terms also in our history that talks about that things may repeat after certain years also. So we need to concentrate on these things. Now the another thing that I just want to mention you about is after those Handley Center, Ladakh Center, Darjeeling Sundarban Center, we saw this trajectory flow of pollutants. What happened? The shoots are not going very up. They are concentrated only within one kilometer and they are probably with ethylometer are trying to see BC and OC, black carbon and elemental carbon. Black carbon and elemental carbon, they are just moving along, reaching Port Blair. There is a very big cloud of 1900 kilometers over Indian Ocean, which we call ABC. It was named as Asian Brown Cloud, but after a quarrel at NASA, why Ramanathan and Dr. Mitra, that why you are mentioning this as Asian Brown Cloud, where similar sort of clouds are also over the Atlantic, it was seen the cloud comprises of uh, elemental carbon and black carbon, basically black carbon. And this is changing our monsoonal route. So if it is quite important, so we had three experiments to confirm that. And when the monsoonal pattern changes, Indo-Gangetic plains are the worst hit. They, let me just tell you about Western disturbance. Even the Panwala knows it very well. Anything odd happens, he says Western disturbance. What is it exactly? About 15 years back at IITM, Sikka, Dr. Sikka and Gardgil, they postulated a theory which is called sikka gardgil effect. Later on, Safir and Simpson worked on that at Italy and they also uh, postulated a theory that in coming times, if there is a small landmass shift in certain millimeters or so towards temperate region, certain Mediterranean winds will originate, come from the Gulf, it will take moisture from Arabian Sea, it will rise high and it will make ice packs. A Parvati glacier had totally melted, there are ice packs this year over there. There has been a very good snowing this year. So those winds have already started taking its flow. The retreating monsoons are colliding with those western disturbances, creating cyclone and basically depressions. And after all, so we are very fortunate to not have hurricanes in this part of the country because the speed doesn't limit is not more than 170 miles. But if it exceeds, they are hurricanes. Have you ever heard thought of that why the names of these hurricanes are named after like Katrina or like Nargis or something like that? What is the reason behind this? The reason is that these are named, the nomenclature is basically in the name of monks and nuns so that the calamity is less. 
So this is the, the naming has already been for the next coming one. Now what happened? We have certain cyclonic depressions which very recently were here and it destroyed our crops. Similar type of cyclone was observed over uh, new old land city before with our remote sensing images. The whole new old land city was totally devastated. But it was totally the people just moved away from there. There was no, no loss of life in that region and people escaped out of there. Similar sort of situations we could have also done with. We have specific type of imageries. NRSC provides the cheapest imagery in the world. They are one by hundred times cheaper than spot, than insect or any country it, it, produces it. ESRI is basically marketing our imageries. Now with satellite imageries has come up as a very, as a boom. Before we used to do with aerial photographs. To judge land use and land cover pattern, the biggest thing that we have in hand is aerial photographs for reconnaissance survey. It is a very simple concept, two similar photographs with 30% side lap and 60% overlap. And you put it under a stereoscope in your dining table, all of a sudden you will see a vertical exaggeration. The whole terrain coming up. And you will be totally excited. Instead of going there, you can see the terrain. And with good GIS models like Ilvis, then we have Eldas GIS models. You can model and put water somewhere. And you can just, with how much gallons of water should escape from anywhere. And you can, this has already been done with Krishna Godavari rivers already. This can be done with Ganges also. So, hydrologists do a better job in that. Surface water, when we talk about, it's not all that goes into the sea. There's a lot of infiltration also taking place. There are monuments like Humayun Tomb in Delhi, where there are beautiful aquifers below that. There are monuments, but we cannot extract water from them because the monument will fall down. But there is water to, uh, there is ample water in only Delhi in certain historical sites that can provide water to whole of Delhi for another 30 years. It's very hypothetical to say that Ganges will disappear in 1940 or something like that. It's totally wrong. I told you about this ABC cloud, now the name has changed into atmospheric ground cloud. They don't say it Asian ground cloud. And the predictions have also improved. Earlier IMD used to uh, predict with 16 parameters. 16 parameters, statistical parameters, out of that 8 parameters were of foreign origin. But now an equino model has been created <coughs> near Makarsar Bay, Indonesia, the heat engine of the world. We are so fortunate. We are so fortunate to have the youngest and the oldest mountains in the world. Youngest are the young fold mountains not yet in their shape, Himalayas. So whatever changes are in the MCT or MBT, we are seeing the sedimentation and the different sort of sedimentation just through the fans and basically which are good for other crops and we are into with other crops. So the crop pattern need to be changed if we need to feed our million and moreover and to enrich our farmers from hand to mouth condition. The other thing here is that when we talk about this upland lowland interaction and the flow of rivers and the mixing of rivers and formation of the deltas and all, we need to safeguard our boundaries also. The corals, the cod fisheries are at a verge of collapse. We have a coastal interaction also. The nutrient flux that we see today that falls into Sundarbans and the Bay of Bengal, we see the collapse of certain type of fishes over there, mercury enrichment and the oil spills that are there through the, because they have turned, the transport routes have also come up. One ten mammals are just are staying in the uh, sea around. So to see a region, we need to see everything around that also. Then only we can come in with a proper consensus that what we can exactly do over there. So the first sort of thing is remote sensing. We can check land use. Every repetitivity of every year we can check it. The first thing is settlements which are coming up. Population is a very big problem. Anthropogenic ecosystem when we talk about is a function of basically population and poverty. If we can just take care of these two things, we can come up with an anthropogenic sort of biome with among us. It's not bad, coming future is not bad, it will take its own course through various calamities and extreme events. Extreme events have totally increased in the name of uh, certain uh, pathogenic uh, invasion or in ways of certain uh, calamities, it will take its own toll. And it has been since time immemorial that basically the uh, wheresoever the civilizations emerged near the rivers or wherever, it was highly populous. So population is there, it will, nature will take care of that. Now here a very big question arises, are we really that influential to change climate? 
We are just at the periphery, we cannot go underneath, we cannot go even one and a half kilometers if we go to the polar fields. Just after one and a half kilometers we feel dizziness and all. So are we really that influential to change climate? So here the question arises of course, we are not really concentrating on the effect of solar and earth's relation and on sunspots. If this sunspot the equation goes good, we will be in a proper situation to tell what will happen next. I have just quoted certain things very important uh, so that I just don't forget and reciprocate. Between 1800 and 1860, forest wood cutting was the main thing. After 1850 to 1999, biomass burning took over and it was just double the impact on carbon flux. What I mean to say is deforestation was there, but biomass burning took double the course from 1850 onwards. One third of the global sediment are drained into the ocean by Ganges and Brahmaputra. If we talk about a system from 1900 to 1947, in the last century, we had Jamindari abolition. And there were micro level of farming basically. 1947 to 1966 saw post-independent era. 66 to 80 was green revolution. And 1980 had sustainable development. But even the cropping pattern has a change. Till 1901 it was all fanny and fanny around. Wheat was important only after 1950. Wheat grown, now after that it uh, just exponentially it increased and people started growing wheat. Earlier till 1901 it was all you and cry about rice. Manu Swambhu, he was the first king of India. He cleared forest for cultivation. Aryans were basically pastoral people basically. They were basically pastoralistic sort of people, they never went for that type of cultivation that was basically done by Harappans. Harappans went for, a, for an urban civilization. I am just talking for, of this Indo-Gangetic plain itself. Some 1500 to 11 years earlier, in Mahabharata also, we, we see about dark, gloomy, dense forest in Ganga Yamuna belt. In Ramayana also, some 1000 years after Mahabharata, there are certain patches, they say they were drought affected. We have Sringa and Brahmanic rituals which talk about Yagna. In these Yagnas, lot of woods from the forest were used. As I told about Alexander's invasion, sometimes in 3027 BC, he said that dense forest in the Shivaliks, in the Sindh area and in the salt range around Jhelum and the forest, forest they retarded Alexander's movement. Here, Mauryans, they say that well, they were well tilling and they had fertile lands during the Mauryan time and Cotelia had appointed certain type of people. They were the superintendent of forest basically. They were called Kupya Daksha who used to look after the forest. They were Sukra Nitisara, forest managers. Then during uh, Huensam in the 7th century AD, he talks about dry patches and some rice cultivation in certain places. There is one Achichatra, which is Bareli now, and he says there were good forest and river around. Buddhist and in Jainis, Jainism, they have proto conservation, they were proto conservationists against the Brahmanist onslaught of nature. This is according to Thapar and Gardgen's study of 1990. I have quotation for everyone. Karl Marx, he, was, he said that nature devastation due to human greed. And then capitalism always, when it came over, it exploited nature. The Brandy's, Brandy's rainfall map was first prepared in 1871, after, he, after the East India Company took over. Savagery to civilization, he says, this was a progressive shift of human intelligence and human skills, basically. Indus Valley civilization saw disappearance within, within 1000 years. This was due to water logging. Now this water logging condition of river beds is quite important. During drought, there are certain patches of water logging and those marshes, methane gas is emitted out of that. All reservoirs in India, either it is Bhakaranangal Dam or it is Nathwa Jhabri, the reservoirs emit methane. If the conditions are in a drought conditions, there are small patches of swamps and marshes. The basic Indus Valley civilization, uh, there is one uh, 